Hello. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use to interact with the webcast. You can submit questions to our presenters by using the Q&A widget or interact with other attendees by typing in the group chat widget. If the slide deck has been made available for download, it can be accessed in the available resources widget on the bottom right hand side of your screen. If you are interested in continuing education credits, please click on the sign up widget in order to specify your credit type. In order to qualify for CPE credits, you must stay logged in for the full hour and click on interactive prompts which populate three times throughout the webcast. A recording of this webcast will be made available 24 hours after the live session and will be emailed to all registrants. You can share this webcast with a colleague or friend by clicking on the light blue share icon. Finally, we appreciate your help in improving our webcasts. An evaluation form will appear at the conclusion of this webcast, and your feedback allows us to continually make better content for you. Thank you from all of us at the Conference Board. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those of us uh, tuning in from Europe. Um, my name is Chiki Cartagena. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for the Conference Board and the leader of our Marketing and Communications Center. Welcome to Marketing Success in 2021. You have an amazing panel waiting to talk to you, so I'm going to be very brief. Today we will be discussing how to pivot and remain relevant to customers during the current paradigm shift. We're going to talk about balancing immediate needs like short-term revenue generation with strategies that produce longer-term value. We're going to explain how to plan for the unknowns. That's going to be good. Uh, <laughs> that are the, on the roadmap for many marketing teams and companies. We're going to exhibit how technology is being leveraged differently this year and within your future strategic plans. And of course, we're going to show marketers what marketers are doing to bring efficiency, repeatability, and cost savings to how they operate. Um, as you heard in the video intro, uh, you can also earn credits. Um, here is just a quick reminder of what you need to do to do that. And of course, we want you to ask questions. We have a ton of great resources for you to download. Please start a group chat and share with your colleagues. So let me go ahead and introduce this amazing panel we have for you today. We have Margaret Norton, Chief of Staff of Mass General Brigham, Chris Hummel, former CMO and CSO of Schneider Electric, SAP, and United Rentals, Paul Matson, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at the Cleveland Clinic, Bob Bejan, Corporate Vice President, Global Events, Studios, and Marketing Community, from Microsoft, the guy with the best job here, and Paul Suchman, Chief Marketing Officer of Entercom. And to kick off the conversation, our own Philip Giuliano, partner at Brand Active. Philip. Awesome, thank you, Chiki. Um, and thanks to the conference board for allowing all of us to come together today. Um, as you can see from the introductions that Chiki gave, um, this panel of executives spans the gamut. Um, particularly when you consider not just the, the, the roles that Cheeky shared, but, you know, I mean, Paul being, you know, former Paul Matson being former CMO of Delta and Margaret head of comms at Eversource, a utility brand that she created through the amalgamation of, of five utility companies and, you know, Bob's experience across agencies and, you know, Paul Suchman being WPP CMO, CMO of CBRE. Um, you know, agency experience as well, and, and Chris, you know, across, you know, everything. So, I mean, there's me, right? And um, I'm here because <laughs> I've had the pleasure of, of working with um, most of these people on this panel, um, sometimes multiple times in their career. I'm helping them really operationally plan and manage some of the large changes that they've been through, um, you know, in my 15 years here at Brand Active. And before that, I was a, an org change and M&A consultant for about six years. Um, so... So this is perhaps the most diverse group of people that we've ever brought together um, with experience across healthcare, airlines, utilities, technology, entertainment, content, B2B, B2C, everything, all right? And um, I think it's important to call it out. This is a large panel, right? Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna lead you through a conversation today that touches on leadership through um, the crisis of 2020, digital transformation, how some of these executives have been able to use 2020 to set them up for 2021 and beyond. Um, 
And this is this is not a pandemic webinar, everybody. I mean, this is a, this is really a discussion about managing, innovating, planning, and executing through crisis and uncertain times. Right. Um, the content shared today is applicable across industries, um, across different crises now and in the future. Um, and I'll lead us through this dialogue for about. 30 to 40 minutes. And the intent of that is to lay out enough content for all of you in the audience there to get creative with your questions. Um, so I cannot <laughs> stress enough the importance of the Q&A feature. Um, use this and use it liberally. If you have questions that you wanna ask our individual panelists or you wanna ask the group, throw a question in there. We'll sort through all the questions, pick out the ones that we have time for. We will stop with 15 minutes left um, in this. And um, whatever we don't get to in the Q&A, we'll do our best to follow up with. So. Um, and also, you know, to our panelists, have some fun, right? You know, if, uh, if a thought sparks an idea, you know, when I direct a question to somebody else, jump in, share your thoughts, um, you know, keep those, keep those additions a little bit brief, but, um, you know, definitely be as open as you can with your thoughts and your strategies, your successes and your failures, because there's learning in all of it. So without further ado, um, let's get right into the panel and I'll, I'll start with kind of a traditional starter interview question um, makes me feel like I'm in HR just bringing it up. But um, I think there's some nuggets in here. It's a three-part question. So I'm going to address it to each one of you, and we'll start with you, Paul Suchman. Um, summarize 2020 in one sentence. What's one thing that you're really proud of that you did? And what's one thing that you wish you didn't do? <laughs> oh, Paul, uh, you're actually on mute. 2020 was the year of the unexpected, would be my summary sentence of that. Uh, really unexpected, some great things, some really challenging things. Um, in terms of what I am most proud of, organizationally, I am just super proud of the way our company came together, remotely really, to serve our clients, to serve our listener audiences without missing a beat as a B2B and a B2C company. We are a better, a more agile, a more client-centric company in 2021 because of the moves and strategies we executed in 2020. Um, from a marketing perspective, as the CMO, uh, we're at the tail end of some really strategic work that will begin manifesting itself in market in Q2 and will have a big impact on our clients, our listeners, our organization, and the industry. And it's not quite ready to be revealed, but I'm just super proud of it. I'm also proud I learned to play the ukulele last year. And uh, I was, you know, I didn't bring it, but looking at Bob's background, I probably should have. We could have entertained. Um, one thing I, I guess uh, I wish I hadn't done is in an effort to stay connected and to stay networked, I really attended a lot of events. I attended a lot of meetings and I probably should have prioritized them. Like things like this meeting today, these are really great nuggets, but having a filter on them and making uh, better choices, which got better as the year went on, would be something if I went back and thought about time management, I would have done differently. Oh, what about you, Margaret? Sorry, I was on mute that time. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting. I was ready, though. I was ready. Hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here today. You know, I, I, I'd have to echo Paul's comment about uh, 2021, sort of the unexpected. You know, I'm joining you today on a, a day that's a little bit of a, a milestone for us here at Mass General Brigham. This is the one-year anniversary of us standing up our incident command to respond to COVID. So uh, we've been at this for a year anticipating about being at this for over a year. But I would say the thing that I'm really proud of is, you know, I have a, a little bit of a less traditional role than some other folks here. I've done marketing, but I serve as the, um, as the uh, chief of staff to our CEO. So I've had a bit of a sideline seat in terms of a, a broad array of activities. <clears throat> and I'm just grateful that I've had the opportunity over this past year to, in some small way, contribute to how our frontline workers have been able to deal with this crisis. My role as an information person, making sure that the um, that we're yeah. um, being responsive and informative, but also then also working with our patients to get the word out. Uh, I would say that the one thing that I wish I had done a little bit differently in 2020 is that I hadn't spent so much time thinking about what the deadline was, because who would have known that we would still be here a year later, right? You know, I remember being in my office and and one of our um, one of the members of our staff coming in and saying when we had declared that we were moving to remote work, she's like, I don't think I'm going to see you till May. 
And I was like, nay, that sounds crazy, right? But here we are um, and still at it. And so I think that that was, you know, sort of a, a, a bit of a challenge. And just so I, I guess it, for 2021, what I'm focused on is learning um, the lesson of patience and process and and how um, sometimes the unexpected presents the opportunities that uh, that we most need at that moment. So back Absolutely. to you, Philip. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, what about you, Bob? Unmuting. Um, let me just check in. This this panel is four and a half days long. Is that right? Uh, it is. It is. Sure. Four and a half okay. Days okay. Long. Yeah. No, um, yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, I, I mean, I, I would say twenty twenty is. That I know uh, you uh, you push out there. So yeah. Um, so uh, I, I would uh, I, I'd say twenty twenty was for sure the the year of the unexpected. I completely uh, agree uh, with the earlier comment and uh, sentence. I think for us, the thing maybe that I'm proudest of with the team was the ability to be courageous and really kind of what we now kind of say half jokingly swim into the torpedo and make really hard decisions very early on. And I think that's ended up serving us very well, and that was good. And I think maybe the thing I regret the most is how intellectually lazy I was before 2020. And I think, you know, when I think about how, you know, much progress we've made in the last 10 months about moving, you know, kind of what we think of as the way we think about creating communications and how much of it was totally available, you know, way before any of this started happening. And I kind of go, God, I didn't think of myself as a lazy guy, but God, it really has been something I've been thoughtful about the last 10 or, you know, eight or 10 months, really, because it's mm. it keeps striking me over and over again. It's amazing what we can achieve when we need to, right? <laughs> and how much we don't and how much we don't when we don't have to. And that's the yeah. part that I'm like, I'm, I'm like kind of so disappointed in myself about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, quickly, Paul Matson, let's uh, let's let's hear yours as well. Sure. Our house rule is: if you don't take yourself off mute, you have to make a donation to our caregiver fund. So, um, uh -huh. I'm pretty well trained. Um, so, for us, uh, for me, 2020 was I best describe it as a roller coaster. Um, I think everyone knows how profoundly it affected the healthcare industry, but differently in different areas. So, in Ohio. We also were standing up our incident command at this time last year, anticipating a surge, building a, a, a thousand bed freestanding hospital on our campus. But we didn't get a surge in March and April. We were actually shut down for elective cases in anticipation of a surge by the state that had a significant impact on us, but it didn't come. And then a very mild summer and fall. And then of course, at the beginning of November through the end of the year, a massive surge uh, occurred in the state of Ohio. So it truly was a roller coaster uh, in every respect. For me, uh, the most significant thing we did this year was taking care of our caregivers. Um, you know, they were under so much stress, so much duress, and we uh, transformed the way we do caregiver communications. We went to daily messaging from our CEO. We did two messages, two video messages from him a week. And we took him out around the system, including into a COVID ICU to demonstrate to caregivers that, that we were connected and caring about them. You know, if I think about something that I, um, I wish I didn't do, I, I think we, we, we didn't do a good job of uh, anticipating what was next and how quickly it might come. And we're seeing it right now. COVID cases are dropping in Ohio, but patients are extremely cautious waiting for a vaccine uh, and concerned about the new variants of the virus. So we're pivoting back to some of the messaging we had done earlier about the safety and the precautions we have in the care environment. So it's safe for them to look after their health. So it's been very difficult, but I think as leaders, something you know we need to be continually looking forward and, and beyond the moment that we're Yeah, no, I, th I think rebuilding that trust is something that we're gonna hit on here uh, as well. Um, Chris, I'm just curious from your perspective, you know, 2020 and, you know, a thing you did and a thing you wish you didn't. Yeah, well, hello everyone and thanks for having me. I think like everybody else, this was a year that was challenging to the core is the best way I would describe it. We had politics, healthcare, economics, and even personal, like let's not forget about, it's funny stories to see kids running yeah, in the middle of TV interviews and all those kind of things, but I suddenly became IT tech support for my four kids, um, you know, which okay, was sort of interesting, but but so many challenges across so many different fronts. And 
you know, I'll speak to my experience at United Rentals since that's what I was really running most of the year, the first half of the year when COVID hit. Yeah. And the thing I think we did best was we pivoted um, the level of transparency around not just safety issues, which had already been core to us, but around everything, around all the operational challenges that our customers were facing. Because, you know, delivering equipment, I mean, healthcare clearly was number one, but we were considered an emer um, a critical business as well for, you know, managing how people, uh, you know, set up all these uh, centers and tents and all those kind of things. And so uh, we really got transparent with our customers, which was great. The thing I wish we had done better was stop tinkering. And we were doing a lot of tinkering. And I think because we didn't understand the timelines, we, mm -hmm. we sort of tinker too long and we didn't close things off to be ready for the next challenge that we obviously couldn't see, but that was coming right around the corner. Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I think um, I think there's, you know, starting off with something like this, again, it just kind of, one, it gives the audience a, a good idea of sort of where your mind is, where you've come from, some of the things that you've done, some of the things that you haven't. I think we should um, we should dive into sort of the, the, the forefront of the pandemic on the healthcare side real quick um, and, and just talk about, um, you know, setting strategic priorities and also driving those strategic priorities forward during a, during a crisis situation. This just happened to be a pandemic, so we're in the context of that. But again, I'd say, you know, the content um, is applicable pretty much anywhere. So, you know, starting with you, um, Paul Madsen, just, you know, Cleveland Clinic, um, you know, being the innovator that you are, um, you know, but also, as you mentioned, right, you're in the Midwest, so you weren't at the forefront of the pandemic, and then it came to you and really hit you pretty hard. Um, but you were still there as, as sort of a leader in the information of the whole thing. How did you as a marketer, a strategist, an educator, you know, place your priorities in the right things? And how did that stuff shift in 2020 in the crisis? Yeah, I, you know, I think very quickly we pivoted from focus on our normal priorities of uh, growing the number of patients that we serve and, and, and expanding our market presence to being a leader and providing trusted content and information to our patients and communities and to our caregivers as well. And, you know, I think one thing that's unique about healthcare versus any other industry is we're, we don't sell like other businesses. We don't, uh, we don't have price promotions and deals and offers. Patients come to us because they fundamentally trust us and content is the way they engage with us. Uh, and that's almost entirely digital today. Uh, so we saw explosive growth on all of our digital platforms, our website, uh, our healthcare blog, Health Essentials, our Cleveland Clinic newsroom uh, that we, where we were putting out daily stories for the media. Uh, and there was almost an insatiable appetite for um, information about COVID-19, of course, uh, and all the changes that were occurring. And we, we have, we're very fortunate we have a staff of experts, medical experts that we could put out uh, to inform the public. So. We, we really uh, turned off all of our traditional marketing about the second week in March and didn't resume that until uh, May when the governor lifted the stay at home order. So it was a complete pivot to more of a mission driven public service posture to educate and inform the public. Mm. Okay. And, and, and Margaret, I know in, uh, you may have something to add to that. <laughs> So I'll let you, I'll let you if you do. Um, but I am, I am curious, you know, really just uh, strategically, I mean, you, you made a decision, you know, pre-pandemic, right, to take the organization and make a pretty big strategic move with a rebrand. And that was announced, you know, very early on in the year. Um, and, you know, a lot of times in a situation like that, particularly when the organization has so many competing priorities, those kinds of things get pushed off to the side. And I'm curious how you would um, or what you would share uh, with the audience here around how you were able to really make the case to, to move and drive that forward during a time like this. Um, great question, Philip. Thank you. So um, the, the, the big strategic move that uh, Philip is referring to is that we had largely been known as partners, a name that didn't necessarily have um, a lot of identity in the healthcare space, large, you know, a fi financially strong organization that was um, the parent company for some great hospitals that you know their brand names well: Mass General, Brigham and Women, Spalding, Mass Eye and Ear, um, 
McLean, uh, great AMCs, and then a, a network of community hospitals. So we made the decision prior to the pandemic's arrival that we would change our name to Mass General Brigham after much research. And we engaged a tremendous firm to help us do that, Brand Active, um, and two other firms in that uh, at the end of 19, mm -hmm. um, uh, Lippincott we worked with, as well as um, our agency of record, um, uh, Boat House here in Boston. I say that to Philip because uh, Philip and I had that team in that other rebrand that I referenced. So we've done this once or twice before, but what we did is so many of the things that Paul mentioned, really important, we had great content, we needed to be continuing to push that out. But we also recognized that we've made this promise in 2019 that we were gonna to come together as an integrated healthcare system with patients at the center. And we had to continue that work because as hard as it was managing this pandemic and the work that our folks were going through, we knew that we would emerge one day and that we needed to uh, make good on that promise to present this united uh, healthcare, a united integrated healthcare system to the marketplace. So we, uh, because we had assembled a really strong team, we kept going, but in a very quiet way because it just seemed to make more sense. It was um, important that we continue to shift our focus from being a re an organization that was rebranding to an organization that was managing a pandemic, but we also, um, made sure that we kept the resources going. And that was why we were able, when in uh, May, same time, Paul, we have some very similar timelines for this, but in May, when we went out to the market, we had uh, uh, a brand that for the first time, we were able to use in a strategic way to start to bring patients back in for care and in, um, in a much more coordinated way than we had historically. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that 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 brings us sort of into sort of a, a great segue into trust, right? Because I mean, this, this isn't, you know, a defective product catching fire on an airplane or a bunch of people getting sick at a restaurant, right, um, where you have to rebuild trust, but rebuilding trust in a brand so that people know it's safe to come back um, for those other areas of care that aren't pandemic related. Um, do you have any insight? I'm directing this towards really the whole panel, but, you know, Margaret and Paul Matson. Um, do you have any advice on, on how to rebuild that trust? I used the word patience earlier. I think that that patient, as in being patient, but also um, really getting out ahead of the messaging. We spent a tremendous amount of time. The first time that um, as a system we went on air on, uh, on a broad um, integrated communications pla uh, platform was last May to really use every act channel we could to bring our patients back for care. Uh, we had suspended um, a care that we were not able to provide during the pandemic because that was our focus, our COVID patients, but patients needed us to be out there and telling them it was safe to come back. And that was really the campaign that we focused on. Giving the timing of the campaign that we were putting in market to bring patients back, we also need to be very deliberate though. Our employees were working really hard and the focus of that first and foremost needed to be a thank you to our employees that were delivering that care. We had to explain our new brand and then we had to assure them that it was safe. So we had to, we, we asked a lot of the work and the identity that we were bringing forward and continue to bring forward. This would be a multi-year journey, but we had a lot of work to do and it continues, um, but having um, a deliberate approach to our marketing really helped us unify our voice and think about the patient experience um, first and foremost. Mm. Yeah, I, I would just build on that by saying, um, you know, our strategy was to lead with information. And that's very much building on what we do every day in our communications and marketing. Uh, and the number one source that patients trust, of course, is their physicians and nurses, the people that they're inter interacting with on the front line, uh, even more than hospital CEOs and certainly more than the government or politicians. So we, we constantly were updating information, everything we knew about the virus, what people could do for prevention, um, and making it broadly available online through the media and so forth. We're continuing that today with the vaccine. We see the exact same thing is true. Uh, people want to hear from their medical professionals, and there's inherent trust in that relationship. So every piece of content we create at Cleveland Clinic is vetted and signed off on by our physicians and medical professionals. Uh, and that's really the backbone of our brand is the trust that there's so much medical misinformation out on social media and the internet um, that our brand represents a source of truth and reliable information. And we're not alone in the healthcare space in that regard, but it's, it's a responsibility we have 
um, as not-for-profit health systems yeah. to serve the community. Yeah, I mean, you're you're in a you're in a very unique position in the sense that it is healthcare, and people do trust doctors, and trust in healthcare has never been higher um, right now. So I'm going to ask one person um, from the panel that's not in healthcare. You know, if you think that this this strategy of content information being a trusted resource is being transparent and truthful, is that the strategy emerging from crisis for you? You know, in in, in your experience, or do you have anything to add to that? I'd like to add something. So uh, Intercom is in the audio space. We are uh, we have a very big footprint in broadcast radio. We are a leading podcasting company, a big digital streaming presence, and a big events presence. So we are this audio ecosystem. And during the pandemic, I was thinking about what uh, um, what everybody was saying about healthcare and that information, and it's just ringing so true with me. Our news stations, in particular, really served as crucial lifelines. Uh, during the pandemic, during the social issues, providing informative, essential information to all of the communities we serve, um, social issues, pandemic. And again, trust was at the center of that because this content was coming from sources, from voices, from brands that people rely upon and trust. So as Margaret was talking about, it's like this combination of having the right content, but delivering it from a brand that you have built equity in as a trusted source. That combination um, really saw us through this pandemic, and it sounds like it saw those brands through the <laughs> pandemic as well. Awesome. And, and Philip, if I can, if I could just jump in a sec, I, I would say also from yeah. the conference board perspective, we uh, we put up a, a COVID hub uh, because this was a pandemic that affected all aspects of business, supply chain, human capital, you name it, right? And we saw very quickly um, the response from our members. I mean, in, in the first couple months, we had 300,000 hits. We're doing now the same with the vaccine, right? That even though it feels like a healthcare issue, it, there are a lot of implications for businesses. So we're surrounding the issues with all of our thought leadership. And I think that's to, to what Paul was saying, a, a way to build that trust. Excellent, excellent. I um, I, I wanted to get into a panel, but I'm actually gonna, uh, a poll question, but I'm actually gonna skip that and let's shift um, uh, Bob um, over to the other side of sort of massive disruption, which is, you know, sort of the digital transformation. You know, we could talk about telehealth, but I mean, here we are, you know, on a web platform, you know, we use Teams every day. And, you know, I found a lot of our conversation uh, fascinating. Um, and, you know, I think you have a great perspective to share even just about what's to come um, for people as they start looking at, you know, events and how they collaborate. Um, and so let's let's start sort of with your journey, because, you know, you, you started off 2020 with, you know, 28 in-person major events that you had to do. Um, in the first four right? months, right? Just before, yeah. between <laughs> then and April. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, and an events group that didn't even, you know, leverage Microsoft platforms um, for True. that kind of stuff, right? So, True. and Teams now playing such a critical role for all of us, well, at least, you know, for me on a daily basis. Um, what can you share with people about being agile and how your role even has changed into product development, for example, um, well, as you've moved through this? Well, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, an, it's kind of a wild story, right? But I would say oh, the root of it is the thing that I said in kind of answer to your, uh, you know, your introductory break the ice question, which is we were so fortunate that we, we collectively as a team kind of pinky sweared and said, let's take advantage, right? You know, because it's so, it's so dramatic, right? And all of us can think back to the beginning of that the appearance of it and what was happening and all of the debate, is it gonna, are the events gonna stay, are they not? Hybrid, what should we keep going? Double track planning. And we were just very early on, I think because we had so many events going that we kind of said, hey, you know what? This is an opportunity more than anything to focus mm -hmm. on the digital world. And so we made this bold presentation to our senior leadership team that said, hey, our proposal is, is that we, don't, we stop doing live events in total until the end of our the next fiscal year, which will be coming up in July, um, and and we just said and and that we just focus on what can we do to move this ball forward in the digital world. And they said, yeah, that's a great idea. And then the second thing we talked about was, well, here's the persnickety part. We're not really using any Microsoft technology right now. We'd love to. It seems like an incredible opportunity 
to create a showcase for our technologies, but it means that we're gonna to have to get a lot closer to engineering and we're gonna need some things that don't currently work on the platforms today. And you know, to, again, to the company's total credit, they were like, we're gonna do it. And we, part, we got deeply partnered with our engineering teams. And then starting with Build in April, you know, we shipped on a platform that was built entirely on Microsoft technologies, a couple third party parts that work in Azure, um, but really teams at the center of it all. And, you know, it's been a fantastic thing because I think we're, we don't make events anymore. What we make is interactive television. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be doing that for a long time. I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna ask you to be a futurist here in a second, but I do want to get to one of our poll questions real quick. So. I'll um, I'll ask the audience uh, to to look at this and, and and say you know pick pick three you know what are what are your top three areas of highest marketing investment shift from 2020 to 2021 where are you putting your dollars more in 2021 than you would have in 2020 so I'll give you a little bit of time to uh, to pick out three things there and submit them and and then we'll we'll share some of the results. Um, you know, I'm curious. I'm curious. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe we go to Paul Suchman on this one real quick, just quickly. Um, you know, how would you be looking at this? You know, I'm looking at this list, and they're all important, right? Everything <laughs> is absolutely uh, important. We are continuing to invest in our content and our thought leadership. We are investing in our brand. Um, we are investing in our marketing technology um, to be better inside the organization and to be better outside in serving our consumer listeners and, and serving our, our clients, our, our, our revenue sources. Um, and we're also putting a premium on creative as well. Events remains a question, right? Um, mm -hmm. How we are going to invest in, in participating them, how we're going to host them. So that really remains a question. Um, and I think you put experiential into that a little bit. And the other one is data. Data is super, super important. We're making a lot of investment in getting smarter with data. Yeah. Yeah. I am. Um... Please do, uh, everyone out there, please do participate in this. Right now we've got about 30% of attendees that have, uh, that have responded. Um, please do respond. When we get past 50% or so, I'll, I'll stop us here. But Chris, um, just from, the, from your, your career in growth and strategy, if you, know, if you were running back as a CMO, where would you be looking in 2021? Well, I think it ties back actually, Philip, to the question of trust and communication that people were talking about. So if I were, you know, as Paul said, all of these are important, but the one that I've, I've kind of focused on most is how do I become more transparent to customers? How do I communicate with them more frequently? Because mm -hmm. look, we're gonna screw up, we're gonna make mistakes, uh, but the reality is they wanna hear from us. And then I think the third is to give them the ability to actually engage in real time. And so if I were gonna pick one, more than anything else, I would probably go with the digital and social, not just in terms of a website or those kind of things, but how you can actually uh, start to engage with them uh, through experiences, whether it's setting up contactless experiences or whether it's just communication and engagement. I mean, we saw some real massive buying behavior, again, at United Rentals, where you know our, our phone calls were our lifeblood in terms of getting reservations. And we saw the amount of uh, phone calls that were driven by search triple uh, wow. in the like six months prior to prior to the pandemic, let alone what happened in the pandemic. So mm -hmm. the volume didn't necessarily the volume went up, went down, whatever. But it uh, it was so driven by a new behavior that it actually challenged some of our core fundamental beliefs of how we were engaging with our customers. Yeah. No. I'm, I'm just not even going to give you a countdown on that one. I'm going to shift over. We got, uh, we got a little over 50% of people um, responding. So, you know, investments in digital and social um, data, definitely content and thought leadership brand, interestingly. Um, so that's actually, I mean, that's a, that's, 
some of that, some of that surprising, some of that not. Um, you know, we are we are definitely finding that um, investment in brand fairly across the board, industry by industry, is definitely going up. Data and digital and social is you know going through the roof. You know, across our client base, so that stuff is not surprising. Cheeky, it looks like you might want to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to share with everybody that uh, we just released our C-suite challenge, which is a global survey of the C-suite, and digital transformation was the number one issue on all C-suite mind right now. I think this reflects that quite well. Yeah. So, so Bob, back to you. I'm, I'm going to ask you to be a futurist, since everybody out there is, you know, either planning or attending or producing or leading events. Um, you know, what do you see as the future of events going forward and what advice for success would you give people out there in the audience that are watching today? You're on mute again, actually. Because I'm, because I'm trying to be so compliant with the direction you guys gave us. So, you know, that's what the deal is. And so, no, I look, I think there are two things that at least for us are kind of propelling us forward as we continue to try and get better and, and discover what this new medium kind of is and its relationship to live execution. Here's the two things we'd say. First, when you look at digital events, the big surprise, at least to us, is not only are they much more effective than we expected, and you know, when you start to look at the data of efficacy and what people appreciate and what they're digesting and what they're taking with them and the metrics that are important to us, if they're actually, much, in many cases, way more effective than live events, super interesting, we weren't expecting that. They're obviously hugely more ex inclusive in terms of being able to get the world in, into them. Um, and they cost less. Um, and then kind of the final big one, especially for us in the commitments we're making in terms of sustainability, you know, this year it looks like a lot, what we're doing in digital event space at Microsoft may be one of the, if not the biggest contributor to the reduction of our carbon footprint in the world. So you kind of go, wow, the digital impact of that, you know, that, that's not going to go away. That core is going to be part of what we're doing moving forward. And, and, and then I think what happens is, is that, it, you know, what happens is that that tentpole goes up in the digital world, all inclusive, much more, you know, kind of uh, global in its nature. And then companies and entities and organizations can ex execute simultaneously in local and regional live executions that are done either adjacent or as part of an integrated experience with the digital core. And, you know, in some ways you can kind of, it makes it easier to see how it could work that way, especially as you watch the world kind of dial up, dial down, it's open, it's not, it's, you know, things are changing all the time. And that means, you know, for those of us who used to do big live events, you know, you commit to those things years in advance. And like, that's just, it's hard to justify that from a business point of view now with so much uncertainty and all of the points I mentioned in the positive of what the digital event world can do. So, I mean, we're super bullish and we think that there's a huge amount of creativity that can be done in that relationship between digital delivery and then live local and regional execution. And, you know, the next three to five years kind of could easily be filled with kind of innovation and creative exploration in that relationship. And it also sounds, Bob, like you're gonna even drive more customer intimacy by changing your strategy as opposed to bringing them together into these big forms, making it much more pointed and focused and, and intimate. No, you're totally right. And, and the thing is, is one of the kind of the underlying little like, ooh, I didn't think about that really is, you know, we all tell ourselves, oh, live events are coming back. Everybody loves them. Nothing can replace them. They're so important. All true. Yeah, full stop. All true. But not every human being is so into any of those things. And part of the inclusivity that we're seeing, you know, like the, you know, the numbers are staggering. You know, we did 6,000 people for build last year in the live instantiation of the show. This year, we did 197,000 people. And so you kind of go, you know, the, the, it's so different. And it really kind of puts you in this position of like kind of going, hey, look, this is the, this is the way you move forward. This is the way it works. Philip, if I could jump in, I have a, another data point that might be interesting because I think we think people traditionally behave in certain ways and behavior will carry on forever. But in February of last year, we had about 1,500 telehealth visits. Somebody referenced telehealth easier. For, um, for the last year, 
we've we've recently surpassed the two million mark for telehealth visits for patients. So two million patients came to us in ways that they had never really thought would work for them, and suddenly they are working. <clears throat> and so we don't see that. You know, we may see some degradation in the numbers of those, but we don't see that we will fundamentally step away from that. We just have to really be able and ready for our patients to think about how we're going to care for them in ways that they became really used to really fast. And kudos to them for that. Because the the pandemic has forced people to adopt some behavior that before they were a little more resistant to, right? The telemedicine is the perfect example, but DoorDash and gro online grocery, thank God it was all set up, right? Because now you're taking advantage of it, but. So true. Awkward silence. I'm happy to fill it. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Again, okay. <laughs> trying to. Um, so, no, that's great. Um, need, need is a need is a hell of a driver of change. Um, as we as we move into 2021, um, I want to touch on a few things here with with Paul and Chris. You know, Paul, um, you know, you were under quite a lot of pressure um, in 2020. You know, as advertising dollars shifted and you know, your business models and your extensions, you know, of your business were expanding. You made some very strategic moves. You made some acquisitions. Um, you know, you, you worked on positioning and messaging and, you know, what the company stand for and what the future is. Can you talk about how you were able to, I mean, for lack of a better phraseology to it, you know, take advantage of 2020 to set yourself up for 2021, even though your industry was one that was actually under pressure? Sure. Um, and a lot of what I'll share has been already echoed by, by the panelists, a lot of these same kinds of strategies. First and foremost, we remained unwaveringly focused on our listeners and our listeners on, in the broadcast space, our listeners in the digital space, our listeners right. in the podcasting mm -hmm. space, and really Patients, creating- Customers, uh, listeners. <laughs> yep, yeah, so yep. customer, so yeah, so, so I'm talking us, I'm talking end users, consumers, audience. At the end of the day, we are an advertising driven model, but what advertisers come to us for is that audience, is that audience we bring in day after day after day to our content, to our experiences. And we stay focused on them, creating content and experiences to really engage with them and bond with them more than ever. The audio consumption through last year, it just went through the roof. People were actually consuming more audio in more places. Traditional day parts uh, actually went away. We optimized music formats. We enhanced our sports offering, our talk offering, our news um, with new programming, new voices, new content types. And our podcasting business in particular produced some of the most influential and awarded work uh, in the marketplace in 2020. And I think I talked about our news, what our news stations delivered already. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, we stayed totally focused on our clients. Um, and we have two, we have a lot of different clients. We have large enterprise clients and we have very local clients who may be local to a market or a cluster of markets. And with our larger clients, we help them with new messaging and creative strategies and targeting strategies to reach, uh, to reach their audiences on our platforms in really relevant, meaningful, sensitive ways, given all of the headwinds that they were facing. Um, and with our local clients who had other challenges, like staying in business, we helped them with flexible plans and flexible strategies and uh, everything they needed as they were keeping their own businesses afloat, because we are right there in the communities that our local clients are in. At the same time, we looked at our business. We took that moment to look at our business and we did optimize our messaging and we optimized the integration of our platform that we were talking about. But we made some great uh, acquisitions, as, as you noted, in the sports betting space, uh, which created a new revenue stream for the company and also enhanced our overall sports uh, entertainment offering. Um, we, we locked in uh, a lot of multi-year partnerships with uh, several clients and we added key leadership positions in a time when other companies weren't to help accelerate right. growth. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, our leadership team, despite the headwinds that we were facing and the, with the pressure we were under, continued to invest in our growth and position us for a, for a strong 2021. 
We did yeah. some research too that I think is worth just quickly mentioning because it echoes what everybody else did about the immersion factor of audio and how people actually get immersed with it. And what we found was that audio, more than almost any other medium, has, a, has an immersion factor and an engagement factor that's earned because it comes from sources, voices, programming that people know, the word we've been using, trust and rely upon. And that has, you know, the, what we did with our listeners, what we did with our customers, what we did organizationally, and the story we have to tell about content to customers in 2021 has really positioned us to accelerate growth um, as we come out of this. That's great. That's great. And, and growth being the last word you used, I, I, I want to ask one more question here to Chris, um, Chris Hummel. Um, you know, growth and I mean, it's basically been your career, <laughs> you know, at least for the time that I've known you, it's what you've been hired to drive and do. And now, you know, with your work at the at the um, Revenue Institute, I mean, you know, can you talk about um, any advice that you would give to people, you know, going into 2021, you know, uncertain times, how to strategically plan because growth shocker is still on the table for pretty much every company out there, if not survival. Um, so what advice would you give people um, going into 2021 around how to strategically plan um, for growth in uncertain times? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and Paul teed it up as a softball. But the, um, you know, some of the research we've been doing at the Revenue Enablement Institute suggests that uh, we're a year in uh, roughly to this pandemic. And uh, as hard as it is, survival was obviously the first thing that everybody was focused on from, a, from a, the business and a personal standpoint, but let's say from a business standpoint, but most organizations have kind of figured out, am I going to survive or am I, am I not going to survive? And, and I now need to live in this new environment. And so growth is returning as the number one uh, kind of core purpose and goal. And that to, to obtain that, what's happening is some interesting things. Uh, first of all, people are recognizing that growth is a team sport. Growth is not only marketing. Growth is not only sales. It's not service. It's pulling it all together. And a lot of organizations have some challenges in aligning all their C-suite or all their leadership around a core purpose. Um, they can nominally do it, but when they actually look at the operations. And so a lot of companies are trying to foster a new HR strategy around this sort of emerging CXO, this uh, new generation of leaders that then goes to the second piece. So the first part is talent and, and kind of mission and whatnot. The second is really around understanding the changes in the buyer behavior and being able to capture those signals and sort of figure out how far do they push? Does it require tinkering? Does it require communications? Is it a brand challenge? Is it a something else structural? Are there new opportunities that are come up? But really understanding the buyers and then mapping your offerings on top of those or to those is critical. And what it leads to, which I think is the most interesting thing coming out of our research, is this idea of a sort of 21st century commercial model where a lot of that tinkering is just not enough anymore. A lot of that operational change, hey, let's do some more campaigns, let's, let's shift our, our spend a little more. Um, it's not enough, and, and there's more appetite now, I think, for business model shift. Um, I don't want to use transformation per se because it's not always a transformation, but you know whether you see restaurants that have turned to now become, you know, a beer delivery uh, because they've got microbreweries, <laughs> or, or, you, yeah. or you look at all kinds of other things that are completely changing what the business is that they're in because they found that their assets apply to a different kind of buying behavior. I think. Uh, my, my recommendation to the sort of marketeers out there in this is you have a lot of the skills to help pull all this together, to align the business around a common purpose and a goal, to help understand a comprehensive view of the, the buyer's behavior, and then even to introduce how those new shifts in the business model can generate revenue and drive growth. Because it's not a short-term thing. This is about now, and this is about the arc going forward several years. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a great shift into our first um, question from the audience, actually, Chris. Um, so I'm actually going to direct it to you and allow you to continue on that thought stream because it's, um, you know, what does innovation mean or look like to you and your company in 2021? 
uh, I, I think it, it's obviously um, there's three parts to it. There's one part, which is for me, innovation is always data driven. Um, and we have so much data. It's really not so much about capturing the data. It's about identifying in that data, the things that will make a difference. So I talked a little bit about signals and understanding the signals, but um, finding things that are data driven is one around innovation. The second is don't be afraid to move, meaning like do, like, you know, everybody talks about ready, aim, fire. Okay, well, sometimes it's ready, fire, aim, and uh, tinker a little bit. If you're not gonna sort of jeopardize the whole business, but getting out there live and testing new uh, products, new approaches, whether it be new like um, goods you're offering or new strategies or whatever, the best way to figure out whether they're gonna work is to test them and get them out there. And you can do it through pilots, you can do it through through limited sort of ways. And then the other piece is, I, I think in innovation, and um, it's a little bit what Bob was talking about at Microsoft and the things they're doing, is we've all, I think, gone through in this process of innovation, digital, whatever, this view of like events, okay, well, I'm not gonna do physical events, so now I'm gonna do remote events. Or I'm not gonna do meetings, I'm not gonna do remote meetings. And we try to replicate basically the physical experience just using technology. And instead of just substituting, I think we need to recognize where technology and innovation actually has more challenges and things that it can do better, right? Like events like this, we're starting, we're still evolving in how to make them use the vehicle and the medium to be even more um, powerful, whether it's in augmented information during the event or having multiple people to be available at a very short notice, like this August yeah. panel and these kind of things. So how to use the technology in its native form, not just to replicate what we thought we used to do. That's right. And that's the number one thing we've been saying, you know, and that's our biggest learning is that you can't translate these things. You have to reinvent them in the medium you're in. And, and like, and, and the truth is, is the more you try and replicate and do what you did in the live world, you know, in a very real way, the more you make people winsome and miss the thing they didn't have. And so in a, in a strange yeah. way, you put yourself behind the eight ball before you even begin. And, and this notion of, of an emerging new medium, not making events, really making interactive television is, it's, you know, there's something yeah. to it. Yeah, I'd, um, I'd be remiss not to direct this question to you, Paul Matson. You've got an innovation center. Um, so what, what does innovation look like for you um, in 2021? Where's the priority? No, I, I'd say historically in healthcare, much of the innovation was clinical, medical devices in particular, but also um, innovation in terms of um, people looking at pharmaceutical solutions, those types of things. But it's shifting for us. Um, we just announced this week the development of um, a new um, health innovation corridor in Cleveland with the state of Ohio and four other partner institutions. And that's uh, gonna be focused on global and emerging pathogens and human health. So that's a completely new focus area for the organization. It's gonna be the single largest research investment in the history of the Cleveland Clinic. So that's certainly one uh, area for us. It was something that was envisioned before the pandemic started, but it, it obviously is very timely. But for us, innovation extends to other areas. Um, uh, technology, of course, uh, Margaret talked about the explosion of virtual medicine, remote monitoring, which allows us to extend our care into other markets. For example, we monitor uh, neurological and epilepsy patients in the UAE from our home here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and the third form is, I would say, um, uh, organizational uh, innovation, uh, things we've done in recent years. One was creating the first office of patient experience to take a unified approach to, to, to looking after the patient. Recently, we created an integrated office of caregiver experience, so the mirror images of each other because our caregivers play such an important role uh, in care. And then lastly for us, you know, there continue to be, uh, it con continues to be innovation in taking our medical model elsewhere in the world. We built the first right. academic medical center from the ground up in the Middle East in, in Abu Dhabi. And we're in the process of completing um, a new a hospital that will open at the start of 2020 in London. So 
many different fronts for innovation. I think the key is not to limit your thinking about innovation, but to pursue it in multiple ways across the organization. Definitely. There's a, there's a, there's a budget question that came in as well, um, which, which is an interesting one because, you know, I, I know, I know quite a lot of clients that didn't actually face the budget pressures from a marketing perspective that they, um, that they expected to face uh, in 2020. It, many of them actually got an all systems go and actually even more investment um, in some cases. So, you know, the question is the pandemic gave CFOs license to devastate B2B budgets in 2020. How will the panel navigate getting a return to more normal levels of marketing investment in 2021 and beyond? Uh, maybe Bob Bejan, Paul Suchman, you've got something you want to add there. Well, I would say, you know, it's, it's very interesting. And we're just about to start our next fiscal year planning cycle. And I, I would, the first thing I would say is what's the, what's the definition of normal? Because if you, if you look at the little world that I get to manage and be a part of, you know, the, we were able to shrink what we were doing in the live events world, the budget associated with all the work we're doing. And in fact, we're doing more work this year than we did last year because this stuff is working well for us. Um, but we kind of shrunk the budget like 55%. And so now you kind of go, okay, well, if we're gonna keep making this digital core, like 10% like more looks like a huge investment in the, in the digital capability world of what we're doing. And so it's just a very different and a very interesting discussion to be having because you know, if eight months ago, I would have been saying, oh, yeah, how do you get back to that 55 percent? But now it doesn't seem like the right thing to do at all. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to add to that one? I would agree. I would agree with everything Bob just said. And, you know, in defense of our CFO, uh, it, it was not a slash and burn. And it, it was it was continue to invest, but really focus on the things that are going to deliver the most value. Um, and it actually made us as a marketing team stronger, more precise. It really, it really allowed us to look at everything we were doing and prioritize and do less things really, really well. But we weren't starved for budget. We had less budget, but we made it work harder. So, um, yeah, and I think the, the the question of value in your in your statement there, because I know in, in in our conversations and in our work, you know the value isn't just revenue, right? It's, you know, strategic position of where it is you're going and the value of all of that. And, you know, so I think, you know, having a, having a broader picture of value um, is another piece that comes out of what you were just saying there, unless I'm, you know, wrong. Um, I think that um, right there is probably where we're gonna need to, uh, to stop the discussion element of this. I know Cheeky's got a few things that she wants to say, but, uh, I want to say thank you, first of all, to all of our panelists for being here and um, sharing your thoughts to the audience and obviously for everyone that's attending. I hope you got something out of this. There are a few other questions. We'll, um, we'll get back to those, um, send them out to the group here and see if anyone has any thoughts they want to share and, and see if we can get back to you with that. So um, thank you, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week. Cheeky, back to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I do just want to remind people that uh, – this is one of the many things that we do at the conference board. We have conferences, we have councils, of course, and I'm just uh, putting up here one that we're doing in early March that might interest people, uh, the Building a More Civil and Just Society. This is going to be a two-day conference with uh, C-suite speakers, um, a broad swath, uh, really trying to address some uh, uh, very necessary conversations around the organizational impact and social changes, uh, social change issues, uh, which, you know, obviously erupted. The pandemic brought to light a lot of uh, inequities. Um, and our CEO uh, started interviewing other CEOs. And uh, as a result, now we're going to build out this wonderful conference. Um, and of course, if anybody watching wants to also sponsor a webcast like this one, uh, we are always uh, open to ideas um, in the marketing and communications center um, and so i just want to let people know if you're interested you can certainly uh, reach out to our team and uh, consider that so with that we're at the top of the hour i want to wish everybody a wonderful wonderful day thank you all my incredible panelists philip what a great job moderating and all i learned so much i took like a full page of notes thank you again awesome thank you everybody Thanks Thank all. you. Thanks.